Welcome everyone to Homeless in San Diego. I am Greg Angel, host of our podcast. I serve as CEO here at Interfaith Community Services, and we are joined today for the very first time. More than 100 episodes of Homeless in, the, in San Diego. We're joined today for the very first time by a property manager, someone literally helping people overcome homelessness, Mr. Eddie Walker. Good morning. Thank you for, for inviting me and glad to be here. So welcome, welcome to the show, Mr. Eddie. Um, you are the property manager at, at where? The Quince Park Apartments at 710 North Quince Street here in Escondido. How many apartments there? There are 43. 43. And do you live on site as a property manager? I live on site. How long have you been in that role? I've been in the property manager role for approximately 13 years. Okay. You have a, an interesting background before we hit record. You were sharing about a, a previous uh, previous role as a scuba diving instructor. Um, did I get that correct? Yes, you did. And um, I'm guessing that you've probably done a fair amount of other interesting things in your life. I have. If I give you a cross section of that, I was I had a career with Bristol Myers Squibb Pharmaceuticals. I have a bachelor's degree in clinical and pathogenic microbiology, with an emphasis on electron microscopy. Okay, I don't know what you just said, but maybe some of our listeners did, so thank you. <laughs> I was um, vice president of international national sales for a radiographic table manufacturer for C arm tables. I was an air traffic controller at one time. No kidding. Yes. And then I've been in this particular role for the last 12, almost 13 years. My grandfather was an air traffic controller uh, in the early days of the FAA. Yes. So uh, that's why I jumped out at that. That was one thing I actually can, can resonate with from what you shared. But wow, what, an, uh, what a remarkable career, uh, many careers that you've had, uh, Mr. Walker. Yes, I have. So what led you to, into property management? Well, I, I've been at the particular property now for 24 years. I initially moved there because I was looking for an economical place to live because I was traveling so much. I was gone every two weeks, hmm. and I was gone for approximately 10 to 12 days every two weeks. Uh, well, uh, 10 to 12 days every month. Got it. So, so therefore, I just if I could live in a storage shed, I would have done that, but you couldn't do that. So that's where I, I came to Quince Park Apartments. Uh, I was there for a while, and then the economy went south. And my business dried up like water in the desert. Mm -hmm. So I was posed with, okay, what do I do now? But things were so bad at Quince Park Apartments with uh, the, the various traffic that was coming through, the drug trafficking, prostitution, and the like, that I was ready to leave. And then the owner at the time came to me and says, Eddie, I know you have corporate experience and everything else, and you know how to run things. I need help. So I told him, if you tie my hands, I can't do it. If you let me, don't tie my hands, I can do it. So in the first 18 months that I was property manager at Quince Park Apartments, there were 18 families that had to go. Got it all cleaned up. Then the new, man, the new property owner came to take over the property, and I didn't know who he was. And he would observe me doing my things every day. And then he came away with, because usually when a new owner comes in, they get rid of everyone. Mm -hmm. But he, his, his thoughts and his, his feedback from his, his partners and such said that, you know, you got to get rid of everyone. He says, no, I've got to hang on to this guy. And they said, why? Because he cares. And so I didn't know who he was at first, and we started, had a relationship. And over the years, we've become best of friends. Well, I'm sure that it's uh, driven in large part because of your care, but it also has to be informed by his decision to continue to keep you as property manager by your effectiveness as a property manager. Uh, he says we're making him money. <laughs> well, exactly, right? And so that's where I think it's fascinating, and it's, I'm so glad that you took the time to join us today because, as I mentioned, you know we've done 100-plus episodes. We've never had a property manager share um, from, from your perspective You know what is – in the end, the most critical element of all of this, which is getting somebody moved out of homelessness into housing. Yes. So um, can you share with our listeners what experiences have you had as a property manager um, with people moving out of homelessness into housing, into the property that you manage? Well, we have several individuals over the years that have come to us and said, you know, either through a third party or elsewhere, 
that says, you know, we would like to have an apartment. And if we have something available, we sit down and we go through some in-depth uh, discussions. And I base a lot of things on <clears throat> not only what they present on paper, but it's called a gut feeling. And I read several books about intuition. Women are in touch with their intuition more than men. Because the same guy, or a woman will walk down near a street and she'll look down the street and she'll say, something tells you not to go there. Guy will walk down there and he'll get the same feeling, but he'll walk down the street, get mugged, beaten up, or whatever. He knew better. <clears throat> so when we interview everyone, we always talk to my wife afterwards because she's usually in on the interviews. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> and I say, what's your gut? And based on, th based on that, we'll move forward. I believe that everyone that they interview for an apartment will, is almost like going out on a first date. You always put your best foot forward and you try to tell the property manager or whoever's interviewing you what they want to hear. That's not what I'm about. I do more listening and finding out about the person, where they are, what their mindset is, and then we move forward from there because I ask everyone to be as transparent as possible. So there will be other property managers who listen to this podcast. I don't think there probably are a ton who are our regular listeners, but we're definitely going to share this conversation with other property managers who we work with or who we're, who we're trying to work with. Um, so can you speak you know, from property manager to property manager why um, others should consider what you do, which is um, you've been, you, you've helped you, you, you have housed a lot of people and it's not just because you're a good guy. You are a good guy. You're a nice guy, but it's, but the, but it's also because it's financially, um, profitable for the, for the ownership of the apartment complex. So can you share a little bit from property manager to others, other property managers who might be listening, why they should consider? Well, I think one of the reasons why, you know, there's a certain percentage of apartments that are usually empty mm -hmm. on a property. And that is, no income for the ownership. Mm -hmm. Considering those particular percentages, you might look at someone who might be homeless, someone who, who has needs for an apartment, and really start looking at what is your criteria to moving in. It can't be just an application filled out, here it is, and then you look at it and say, no, they don't qualify. You try to get into the person that you're trying to get qualified and get beyond the paperwork to get to know who your tenant will be. And just by having a conversation, it might take longer than the, than the average interview for an apartment, but getting to know the person and even having a subsequent interview afterwards. And then you might have some additional questions. They might have additional questions. Making yourself available to this person to ask you questions because questions always develop after they leave. We, you try to, to impress upon them about being really as transparent as possible so that there's something that when you do the background checks or credit checks, background checks, that something doesn't come up that they didn't tell you about. So you're building, building trust with your potential uh, resident. Definitely, definitely. Tenant. And you're building trust, not only that, but you're building alliance of communications. <clears throat> Thinking about communications, you mentioned that you work with third parties, and so uh, a third party could be a group like Interfaith Community Services, where yes. we have an individual we're working with who's who's unsheltered, and we're trying to help them get approved and move into an apartment. So when you have these interviews and you do these screenings, do, do you include third parties in those screenings? Yes, I do, and I look at the third party as an intricate partner in this endeavor. Hmm. I look at the third party as our initial vetting process. Hmm of getting these people housed. Because number one, uh, if you just send us, just send them over, they just get rid of them and get rid of them. Uh, that doesn't do us a service. Because mm. what in the long run happens is that if, we, if they do pass muster and they get in, certain things come up that we gotta get rid of them. That is more time intensive, financially intensive, and it's not good for either side. Correct. So as the third party doing the vetting and say, let's put someone with a particular personality to this particular property. I think it would be a good fit. 
and then we go from there. And then they always call us, all the, the, uh, the caseworkers call us, Eddie, I have an individual or a family, and they give us the background on them. I think you'll like them. Uh, and, and we always have a meet and greet with the prospective tenant. <clears throat> have them give me a call, let's set up an appointment, let's sit down. And after we sit down with them and interview them, then we call the third party, uh, the caseworker, and we say, okay, this is our feedback, this is what we say. And then we usually give them, I think we can move forward on this. It's a heads up. And then we move forward, and this is what we need. Eddie, you said you have 42? 40, 40, 43, 43, which includes my apartment. 43 yeah. apartments. So it's 42. Um, on, an, on, a, on, a, on a typical year, uh, do, you have, do, you have to, do you have any evictions that happen among those 40? Unfortunately, yes. How many roughly per year? I would say if we look at this past year, mm, two. Okay, so a couple a year. Uh, you've been doing this for, for many years, and you've been working with third parties like Interfaith, and you've been helping people who come from an unhoused situation to be accepted in as tenants, often with that third party support. I'm curious, and I haven't asked this in advance, so I don't know the answer. Um, do you have more evictions from kind of general community members who enter through traditional ways, or do you have more evictions from individuals who come out of homelessness? Unfortunately, the percentage is more so from the third party. Okay. And I think what we need to do is we need to partner more closely with the third party, come up with a plan okay. to help address some of these things. Because what I, what I do sometimes when I see if there's something going awry, I usually pull the tenant in, and we have what we call a come-to-Jesus meeting in the office. And I say, listen, this is what's going on. And then here are some options mm -hmm. to try to help them get through this. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say it works maybe 40% of the time. Okay. And they take the ball, and they run with it, and they go. And then they said, you know, I don't. And then we continue with observing. And then we report back to the third party. Um, but then when it gets to the point where, to give you an example, if, if we look at interfaith, <clears throat> you have some tenants that come to us and you pay for a particular period of time. Let's say three months, six months, and everything else. And hopefully during that time, they are doing various endeavors to further their ability to stay in the apartment. Mm -hmm. Many times it doesn't work because they're not following the program or there might be lack of follow-up or follow-through with making sure they're there because what happens is that at the end of the program where you're helping and they're supposed to be taking it on their own, within maybe one or two months, it starts going downhill. And then we start talking to them about, hey, you know, did you, were you able to save this particular amount of money during your time here? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, no, things happen. And I said, I know life happens, but the things that... There's primary things that you have to be responsible. It's number one, a roof over your head. Number two, food on the table. And number three, transportation, if that's the case. And I said, all else are luxuries. So when we look at the, on average, two evictions that you have to go through on an annual basis out of 40 plus apartments, you said it's more likely that individuals who have come out of homelessness are, are in that group. Um, but when we, I'm curious from another perspective, um, how many individuals on average are you uh, renting to on an annual basis who have come out of homelessness, who are being supported by a third party? And where I'm going is um, how frequently does it not work out within your, uh, within your property? Well, um, right now we have, uh, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, we have 12 apartments that are from third party. Okay. And of the 12, uh, one has been evicted this year. Okay. And um, how are the, so, so for one, it, it clearly did not work out or is not working out. What, what about the other 11? How, how are they doing? The other 11, we have one individual from a third party. As a matter of fact, they came from Interfaith. Yeah. That have been with us for, I want to say eight years. Okay. If there was such a thing as a poster child for how a tenant should be, mm. they would be the poster child for that. 
How so? Well, because they came from they drug abuse, alcoholism, went through a program, and they managed to survive and go through the, the various uh, regimens for, for becoming clean. And I, I, I always say that everyone has a story. Hmm. And when we get these new tenants in, I always say, so what's your story? And they'll share. And I'll go, okay, great. This one shared the story with me. And I said, well, how are you feeling? And she said, I am never going back that way. Hmm. And I said, but keep in mind, every day you're going to get, it's a choice when you wake up. And I said, some days you got that little tap on your shoulder that says, hey, remember me? And, and she said, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And I said, but it's like working out in the gym. The more you work that muscle, you get stronger. And you keep telling that voice, shut up. And eventually the voice will still be there. But you have other things going on in your life that the voice sort of takes a second back seat. And she, I mean, that is someone that you can see has taken pride in where they live. Yeah. Well, uh, Eddie, thank you for being a property manager who brings such a, um, such a caring perspective to, to, to your work and who has helped so many people thank overcome you. homelessness. Thank you. Um, before we got started, you were sharing about how you work with different organizations. And I asked you what you wanted to be able to speak to today. And one of the things that you mentioned is that you wanted to be able to speak to those organizations doing this work and provide some feedback on how this can better happen, how we can better work together, groups like Interfaith and Property Managers. And a lot of people who listen to this podcast do work in organizations helping people overcome homelessness. So for those, for people doing this work, helping others um, who are working with property managers, what advice do you have? What, what recommendations and feedback do you have for them? I think first of all, for property managers, keep an open mind. Everyone has a need, mm -hmm. and you probably have the ability to satisfy that need. So try and create a window of opportunity for everyone to step through in order to make this happen. Uh, through partnering with your third parties, getting to know the caseworkers, the caseworkers getting to know you, so that they can rely on you and vice versa if something comes up. If you need support, you give them a call. They're ready to jump in and help you out. Uh, if they need help, if they need help, they call you, and you're ready to jump in and help out. So it, it's a mutual, beneficial relationship, which doesn't exist when you're renting to a uh, an individual who who does not have that that third party support. True, true. And what advice, what recommendations do you have for those third parties for um, someone who works at Interfaith or other organizations? I would say for those third parties to really look at your clients and try to fit that personality with that particular property. Because every property has a, for lack of a better term, persona hmm. and, and, and an attitude or a personality that if you have a particular client that you, that you have that you can fit that personality with that, with that property, I think you have a better chance of getting a win-win situation. Also, you know, the other things that, that the third party might consider is that Interfaith does quite a bit of this already. Um, we have a, a third party that has a, a, a property, not a property manager, but a landlord incentive program mm. that is sort of incentivized the landlord to say, okay, and it's usually monetary. Yeah. And so they do that. They also have a contingent fund that in the event that the person either moves out or gets evicted and they do more damage than their, their, their deposits would cover, there's a contingent fund that says it will cover up to X number of dollars if they do damage beyond that. Yeah, so you have, you have a safety net, you have an insurance policy. Yes, and I think that would make a lot of property owners um, open to that, especially with that stigma that exists with that because they're gonna come in, they're gonna tear the place up, they don't care. But, that if they do this and they, and they get to know their tenants and form that relationship with them, the odds are that it won't happen when they leave. It'll be a mutual, you're going to move on to bigger and better things. And we've seen that in our property several, several times. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, thank you for sharing that feedback. And I know to our listeners who, who do this for a living, they'll appreciate that, that perspective from, uh, from your role as a property manager. You are somebody who goes above and beyond as a property manager. Um, I try. <laughs> you said before we started, everybody deserves a second chance. Yes, that's, a, that's our mantra at, here at Quince Park Apartments. Is, you know, life happens and life might deal you with every set of cards. And I believe life is neither good nor bad. It's just life. Hmm. And it's how you handle it to get through these issues, how you move forward. And so I tell everybody, you know, everyone's entitled to a second chance. I will give you that second chance. You know, you get through our interviewing process and I'll give you that second chance. However, if it doesn't work out, I didn't do this. It's on you and I hold everyone accountable for what they say. Because they can't come out and say, well, you said this, you said this. No, no, no. You said this. So therefore, I hold you accountable. And I think it's all about integrity, of which I think that in our, you know, just to pontificate a bit, um, in our society, we lack integrity these days. Integrity doesn't, doesn't mean good or bad. It's being your word. Hmm. If you say you're going to do something, like you know the rent's due on the first, and you know you're not going to be able to pay that, come and talk to me. Own up to it. You tell me, Eddie, I don't have it. Okay, when can you have it? I can have it on the 5th. Okay, fine. I shouldn't have to chase you on the 5th. You should come with me with integrity and say, Eddie, I don't have it because such and such happened. Okay, so let's see what we can do to work that out. How many people, how many households do you think you've helped who interface in partnership with Interfaith in the years you've been doing this? I would say it had to be at least 30. Yeah. Are there any that come to, are you shared one individual um, who had overcome uh, addiction and other challenges? Are there other, other individuals, other families that come to mind? Oh, yes. Several come to mind. Yeah. Another one lived at our facility for seven years. Then they decided, well, I'm going to move on and get a, you know, I have to move to another city. So yeah. he went to El Cajon and he lived there for a while. Several months after, I got a text message from him. Got any openings? <laughs> he wanted to come back. <coughs> Excuse me. And he came back, and it just so happened he came back to the same apartment that he left. Oh, there you go. Because that became open. And then he stayed there for a while, I, th I believe for about another year. And then he moved out of the country. He moved to the Philippines to get married. Hmm. And he's over there now. Well, Eddie, thank you for being a property manager who goes above and beyond, for being somebody who gives so many people a second chance. Thank you for coming on the show today. Um, it's, it's great to have a, a different perspective than we often hear from on this show. Are, are there other, uh, is, is there other things, are there other things that you'd like to share with our listeners? Anything else that you want to be able to speak to today? Well, I can't think of anything at this particular point in time, but believe me, probably when I leave, I'll come up. It'll, it'll come to you as you're heading out the door. So, you know, this is not something that you, you have scripted. We always have a call to action. So uh, most of the people listening to this show care, right? They, they, they believe in your mantra that everybody deserves a second chance. Yes. And they want to help. So some of them may work in organizations like Interfaith. Some of them may be property managers themselves or have um, connections to, to housing because we're certainly going to share those uh, share this episode with our, our partners in, in that sector. Um, what what what's your call to action, Eddie? What what would you invite and encourage people to consider as we think about homelessness and housing? Well, what I would consider as far as homelessness and housing, and I've seen over the years how it's growing and growing and growing, especially in our area right here. Uh, I say that there there's there's a solution, and we can be part of the solution, partnering with a third party who have the funds to help with this. We have the facilities that they need. What can we do to partner together and put a program together to help facilitate getting more and more people housed? Perfect. It's absolutely a partnership. These issues are uh, exceptionally complex. Homelessness and complicated issues develop slowly over time. They need to be addressed, and it's going to take time to uh, reduce the amount of people who, who are unfortunately on our streets. And the only way to do that is to help them get into places like what you do um, at Quince um, Street Park Apartments. 
and others. So I appreciate you sharing today. Um, thank you for going above and beyond. You shared some stories uh, before we started of uh, really going above and beyond. And uh, uh, for our listeners, um, uh, Eddie is a, a guy who who cares and and really supports supports your residents in, in very um, very supportive ways. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for having me. Thank you to our listeners. I uh, hope you enjoyed the conversation. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. So if you have uh, requests, feedback, other guests that you would like to hear from or see or suggest, please reach out to us. And we appreciate you joining us on Homeless in San Diego. Thank you, Mr. Eddie. Thank you. Good day. <laughs>